um, you, well, I think now I think you're more than the passenger. I think you're the, the main sort of um, driver in this because without you, we wouldn't be able to do it. We're just getting ready to go onto YouTube, and then I will basically start broadcast again. We've got lots of people appearing. Yeah, I think now I think you're more than the passenger. I think you're... right there we go. That is the problem. Whenever you basically do a YouTube live, which is that what happens is is that it basically um, gives you an echo, which is not really quite what we want. Just mute the window. Oh, that would be a good idea. That that, that would be. A little bit more difficult than, than 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 I would normally be trying to do. And now all I need to do is to share the screen, and then we can get ready to roll. Right. Thank you all very very much for joining us. Hopefully you are all able to see us. Unfortunately, we can't see you yet, but we can see what's going on in the chat. Please do use the Q and A because the chat is really quite impossibly difficult to control. We will try and moderate it and. Lizzie um, is is sort of going to be moderating it along with Nick and with uh, James. So so we should be all there. And thank you all very much for joining us from lots of different places all over the place, um, which is very exciting. Now, a couple of important bits of housekeeping before we get started. Yesterday, we were delighted to welcome a large number of people, James, who actually thought they would be meeting you. So I just want to make certain that the people who are here today realize this is not one of our standard tastings. This is a very special craft chapter conversation with you. And I'm just going to show you the bars that we are hoping to be tasting, just because last time we had a little bit of confusion. We had some feedback. That that's what we should be doing. So we will firstly be tasting the standout bar. Then we'll be moving on to the Menacal uh, nibs. Then we will be moving on to the Original Beans uh, Crew uh, Fender Barunga. And then we're going to be doing the uh, wonderful Raka Bourbon, followed by the Boho Milk. And then we'll be culminating down in Cornwall um, with the Wild Gorse Flower. And um, the aim of this is to basically make it as interactive as we possibly can with the sort of 300 or so of you who are on the call. Um, and so the way that we will do that is by using something called menti.com. And um, it's actually going to be pretty simple. Um, you need to go to menti.com. Um, and the number you need is 59, 82, 44, and 33. Um, and please do sort of stay at the end um, because we will be doing... Uh, we'll be having a quiz and we'll also try and take as many questions as we possibly can. Um, right. Um, the other thing I would sort of say is that because we covered James's life in such great detail last time, the aim of today is to try and pickle James's, James's brain, to try and get him to give us some of the learnings from his amazing um, sort of experience in, in, in specialty coffee so that we can get that in, in craft chocolate. And the great thing is that James has actually also um, done a lot of this because he's actually made his own craft chocolate. I don't think I'm betraying any confidences by saying that, am I? No, 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 that's fine. I think, well, I've sort of made versions of it. Mm, it was very good. In fact, I think actually I have. I had quite a long time. I had, we actually had your conch upstairs in our attic, which was very, very exciting. Um, well, I got in trouble for calling it a conch and not a melangeur. Yes, that is true. Although, strictly speaking, and we'll come into this in a minute, it is both a melangeur and a conch. It does both. And we can actually... And because it's so vigorous in what it does, you can actually sort of use it for less time than if you had a longitudinal crush. So I think a melanger is, is sort of fine, but you, I think it would be I think it would be sort of on, on good on both of them. Right. So this is just to sort of get you feeling in it. So, so the, the bit which always depresses me, James, whenever we have a conversation with you is that normally, basically, people, you know, the, the chocolate normally wins. And you ask somebody, what have you done most recently? You know, like sort of read a book, had a bar of chocolate. It's normally have a bar of chocolate. But today, what we're going to actually discover, I think, very, very, very quickly, is that when we ask people, have they had coffee today? I think you're going to smash us, which is, you know, I mean, given that 25% of Brits eat chocolate every day, um, you know, um, and 75% of us eat it every three or four days, you would have thought we'd be doing better. But no, it's, but it's your fan base. So we would be expecting that. And also, most people who love craft chocolate also love specialty coffee. So it works quite well. Um, right. Okay, there you go. We're, we're, we're getting into the swing of things. Brilliant. Now, I think the first thing we should do is talk a little bit about how you taste products. So obviously coffee has a great ritual and we are going to ask you please to basically hold on to this chocolate. We're going to use standout as our example as to how to um, sort of basically savor chocolate. And I'm going to basically get James to be my model as we do this, if that's okay. So um, what you need to do is sort of open the chocolate, admire it, because that's what one should sort of do and sort of say hello to it. Um, and then um, give it a good sniff. But the other thing we'd really, really love you to do is to 
not, not just make a clacking noise, but I'm making sure to open this before. But um, what we'd really love you to do, he's definitely made his packaging a little bit harder to get into now, is when you've got a piece of it, is the, the key with chocolate is, is exactly what James is doing, which is you want to hold it up to your ear and give it a good snap. So that's sort of, the, if, you, if you want to sort of prove that you are the equivalent of a cupping person in, in chocolate terms, that's what you should do. Give it a sniff and then give it a snap because the snap's going to tell you whether or not it's going to melt properly. And that's the absolute key. Um, you should be able to see James. So if you can't see James, that is a bit of a, um, I'm going to basically spotlight him for everybody. Does that work for everybody? Can you now all see him? Is, is everyone able to sort of see James now? Yes, yes, excellent, James. I'm sorry that we've not been showing you. That's terrible. That's, that's okay by me. Um, right, now, what I'd love you to do, James, and given it's only you and I, we've both got to do this. We've basically got to do the next thing, which is to basically hold our noses and put a full piece of chocolate on our, on our, apparently it's only when you talk. So, um, that should be working. I don't know how to make it work. Okay, maybe if I put you up there, it'll work better, I don't know. Um, right. And you should be able to get a little bit of taste at this point, but probably not much else. And what we'd really love you to do now is, once it's melted completely, is to re re basically release your nose and suddenly start doing the heavy breathing act, basically breathe in and out through your mouth. And what should happen is at this point, we should be able to illustrate to you the amazing differences between taste and flavor. So taste, as you all know, is basically a series of receptors that you have in your mouth, um, in your throat, all the way down to your gut, which basically detects the things like sweetness, sourness, saltiness, bitterness, umami, kokumi, metallic, and um, some fattiness. And there's probably about another 10 things in there too, but those are the primary ones. But it's completely different to flavor. And so what should be happening with flavor is that when you basically hold your nose, you shouldn't be able to get very much of it. And that's because flavor is basically driven by your sense of smell. But human beings are unique in actually being able to smell in two different devices. So because we lack something called the transverse lamina, we can smell, which is what most animals can do, whether it be dogs or cats or anything else like that. But what we can also do is when we put a small piece of chocolate in our mouth, or when you have a cup of coffee and you drink some of that, you get something called retronasal olfaction. It basically allows all those flavor volatiles and molecules to basically be detected by your olfactory center. So I think, um, the, the, and the great thing about chocolate, it, well, there are two great things about chocolate, which I know I'm gonna be saying heresy because you guys are all chocolate um, and coffee fans, but um, most people actually think that orthonasally and retronasally, chocolate is very similar. In other words, if you like the smell of chocolate, you will also like the flavor of it when you put it in your mouth. I hate to say it, but I don't think the same is true of coffee. And that's the reason why a lot of people actually put milk in their coffee. Um, but the great thing is, is that, it, that in both cases, there are amazing examples of why we are human beings and why we love savoring food, which is that we get retronasal olfaction. James, what do you think? Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just enjoying the chocolate. I've got, I'm impressed by that. Um, yeah, I, I find our sense of smell completely insane on every level. Um, I didn't know the thing about what work usual in our retronasal qualities if that makes sense. Like I just presumed that every, every, everything worked that way. No, interestingly, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty much unique to humans. There are a few rats who can do it. Dogs definitely can't do it. Cats definitely can't do it. Most rodents can't do it. Very, very few birds can do it. Um, it's actually one of the reasons why they've really struggled to understand how the olfactory bulb works um, because you can't get other animals to sort of play with it and get them to do it. So, and it is this weird thing called the trap um, transverse lamina. It, it, it is extraordinary. But I do find it interesting, though, that, I mean, am I right in thinking that most people who love the smell of coffee don't necessarily love the flavor of it when it's in their mouths? Yeah, yes, that's, I mean, that's true. I think that's, you know, many people are frustrated by the gap between how coffee smells and how coffee tastes. Yeah, and I think it's a strange one. Whereas with chocolate, we don't, re we don't get that much flavor um, just by sniffing it. Um, but, but I think what is interesting, if we just, let's just try the other thing. Um, very quickly, just to get everybody just to grab another piece of chocolate and just scoff it. Because what's fascinating here is that you really won't get anything, I don't think. I mean, everyone just sort of say, you should finish the chocolate by now, swallow it, grab your cup of coffee or grab your cup of tea. Crunch, chalky. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what other senses people are getting from it, but if you eat chocolate very, very fast, apple acid, yeah. 
you you should basically get some taste, but you probably won't get much flavor, which I think is what you're getting. You may get a bit of texture too. Um, so James, I am now going to hand over to you to explain something which we are incredibly grateful to you having developed. So if everyone just swallows and gets going, which is the, the, the flavor wave. And you can, do you want to give the history to how it was almost once a river? Yeah, well, I think we'd been talking, um, a group of us had been working on, on sort of ways to communicate uh, chocolate by sort of using what we knew about our specific sort of areas of expertise. And I think the thing that most tasting notes or, or other aspects sort of lack is a, for want of a better word, temporal dimension. Like they, they, they don't really engage you over the period of time of tasting, you know, to say, what does the acid taste like X? Well, it, it doesn't necessarily taste that way the whole time. And so I think we talked about the kind of journey of flavor and it started out as a sort of winding river. And, you know, you might start here and go here and the river twists and turns as you experience kind of different things at different times. But I think a wave ended up being a better sort of um, analogy. Is it analogy? Is that the word I want? Probably or vehicle or idea because you do have this um, intensity variance over time as well that I think a wave really nicely represents. And so the moment that it starts to melt, you won't get much, you'll get something, and then it evolves and it changes and you tend to reach a kind of peak of intensity. And then that fades back down and sort of washes away, ebbs away, and you're left with the finish. And, and those are, you know, and, and the finish can go on for a, a quite a long time. It can evolve again, you know, and that's true with coffee. That's true with most definitely with chocolate. And so a wave seemed to be a, a kind of nice way to make people think about where they're at in the tasting experience. And the fact that it might've started being very berry. Now it's sort of drifted off into being something, you know, more floral or sort of, you know, something more caramelly in the finish that I think was just an interesting um, way of presenting that sort of journey. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to mute myself because I think there may be some echo um, when I'm when you're talking and I'm not talking. So just apologies if there's a slight lag with everybody for that one. But let, Matt, let me know if that's working or not. But I think you are right. I mean, I think that it's interesting because I think we, we had a, we had, you know, Barry, who's a professor of philosophy. And we also had Rebecca, who's from wine. And she basically sort of brought up sort of the concept of blit, you know, the balance, the length, the intensity, the complexity you get with wine towards the end. But I do think the other thing you get with chocolate a lot is the texture when you first try it. And I know you get texture with coffee too, but I think with chocolate, it's fascinating just to sort of think about the melt. And it's basically, you know, before the wave hits you, it's that melt which you sort of get to. The other thing I would say, and basically what I'd love you all now to do is, and I'm going to basically use James here too, just to sort of call it out, is now that if you savour a piece of the standout, one of the things is, I mean, you guys are all going to be much better at this than most because you're either wine people or you're coffee people, et cetera. You'll have a vocab to do it. But the fascinating thing about most people when they come to articulate flavors or tastes or textures is they don't have much practice in doing it. And so they lack the vocab. So, you know, since Newton, we've been able to explain colors, for example, but, but actually the vocabs that we have for, 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 for most foods are very, very limited. I mean, in fact, even wine and coffee, I think only go back to, you know, University of Davis in the 1980s or something. Um, and these are all fantastic. But I, what I find fascinating is that when somebody actually sort of puts up some words there. Like, I think the word acidic is phenomenally good for this chocolate. I don't know what, what you um, um, what you think. Yeah, I would agree. It has a, it's interesting because it has quite a sort of sharp, almost citric acid kind of quality to it. It's quite tart, but it doesn't necessarily remind me of citrus in any way. It is more berry focused to me. Like it, it just evolves into that. But then about halfway through, with the kind of peak of the crest of the wave, I get quite a lot of floral qualities to it like my brain briefly thinks about rose and other things like that and so i have this kind of berry floral post wave kind of crash into the finish that i think is very nice yeah. um yeah it's it's a it's i like chocolate like this i like coffee like this that kind of berry fruity nice crisp fresh acidity yeah really lovely yeah no i think the, the, i think actually it's the other thing which i think is very interesting is that um if you use your concept of the wave um I think you can also sort of break it down and it helps you actually identify where the beans and how the making may be different. So up front, this bar actually reminds me hugely of a Madagascan chocolate. It's sort yep. of got those bright berry notes, 
But as you sort of say, as you go down the wave, it's very clearly something different. I mean, in actual fact, it is a different bean. It's the Arumbaba, um, you know, province. Um, it, it, these are beans um, basically brought in by original beans to Frederick there. And, and it, it's what they call their chuncho. Um, and, 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 you know, that is, I think, the way you can sort of start separating them out. So actually using the wave, we find very, very useful to try and figure out actually where the beans are coming from and how they're working. Um, mm -hmm. But fantastic, all these descriptions that we've all got. Right. Um, okay. The next thing I think we should talk about is, and I'm actually going to sort of say, I think we'll, we'll come back to Stanak because I actually think they're very, very good at this, is, is, is um, and, um, I think one of the things we should definitely talk a little bit about is packaging, because I think that this is somewhere where coffee could basically teach us in the world of craft chocolate a lot of lessons. So... I'm going to put you on the spot, James, because I've always thought your packaging is amazing. I know you don't like it so much anymore, but I, I think it's... And, and by the way, this is this is a polite way of saying happy birthday to Proof Rock. Yeah, thank years you. Old. This is your 10-year ten year, ten year ten birthday. Yes. Um, what was the question now? Like, uh, So what are the key things you want to get across in your packaging? That's a good question. I think, um, you know, there's there's a... I, I'm going to drift off into philosophy briefly here. There's a tension inside packaging um, within certainly Square Mile. When we talk about it because there's this. This packaging serves two functions in a way, which is one: a coffee roaster will feel the need to accurately describe their product on the packaging, right? And that should be an accurate representation of the taste. Like that's the that's the one side of it. Really, the other side of packaging, the goal of packaging, is to say, to, or to help the person asking the question of, "Would I like this?" coffee should i buy this would i like this uh, and so that's a bit of a disconnect there and so for a long time you know we at square mile really suppressed country of origin on packaging because we felt very strongly that the country of origin was not a good defining quality of coffee the fact that it's from guatemala doesn't tell you that much about how it's going to taste uh, and we we sort of you know almost excluded the country of origin initially and then we sort of brought it back because that's still how people think about coffee right i think it's 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 foolish to go that way but really we're just trying to you know for us first and foremost it's it's about uh who made this initially so farm name and producer should be the, the largest pieces of information on there some taste guidance that should help you you know understand what what sort of category of coffee this is is this a wildly tart fruity acidic thing is this a heavy caramelly sweet thing is this a fermenty wild unusual thing you know within that i think i'm less and less hung up on individual descriptors and because i don't think i'll like a coffee more or less because it tastes appley i'll like it because it's clean and it's sweet and it has you know positive qualities but the individual flavors i think we, we obsess over a little bit too much and then it's about you know i think coffee's obsessed with transparency um you know we want to tell you exactly when it was roasted you know often who roasted it that's often on packaging it's not on ours but it, you know that's a, a part of the coffee industry and we're you know with the packaging we're trying to broadcast that it is a premium product that it's well made it's made with care and intention and that kind of stuff yeah that's that's some of the thinking behind the packaging so I think those are phenomenally useful um, attributes. Um, I think one other attribute I would say is that you have to be able to store the product quite well. So yeah, the practical part of it, you know, the like practical the part of it, and it's quite good. So what we're now going to do is basically, whoops, sorry, we're now going to basically go through a bunch of bars which we think are amazing bars, but we're going to be very blunt, and we have warned the people that we're actually going to um, uh, um, critique their packaging in some small ways. So this bar, um, the Menacal Salt and Nibs, um, is. An amazing bar. Whenever we do um, our virtual tastings, it's one of the ones which um, basically everybody absolutely loves and adores. In fact, um, it's so loved and adored that now with Brexit, we can't get any more of it in for a few weeks. But um, I will basically invite you all to taste this. And while you do it, I'm going to give you a little bit of the story to it. So it's a Madagascan cacao. Um, the company which actually sort of makes it was set up by a couple of Peace Corps volunteers because they were desperate to basically make certain that the some of the benefits from growing cacao other than the stuff that you do on the farm, could actually be enjoyed by local Malagasy. So they got together with a lovely bloke called Shaheen, who's the guy who's in the picture here. Shaheen established a factory, and it was the second factory in Madagascar to actually start crafting chocolate in Madagascar. Um, it comes from the San Barano Valley. Um, Shaheen doesn't actually have his own farm. He works with a small number of farmers directly and gets their beans from them. So here we go. Let's use the wave again and let everybody just sort of think. Oh, there you go. We're already all over it. Um, and then... 
James. Um, but you go, I mean, it does, I think, slightly have those slightly bright notes, which do remind me of, um, you know, the, the standout. But the, 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 the sort of the wave as you sort of go down it is completely different. Um, I'm almost getting a little bit of bubble gum on it actually tonight. I don't know mm. else here. Mushroom, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Theobromine, yeah, I'm not quite sure what that one means, but I definitely get that one. And we will buy Bitcoin, I promise. Dogecoin, come on. Far too sweet. Okay, that's fine. It's interesting. It's, it's, I'm not meaning to be critical. It's a little hollow in the middle for me. Yeah. Like it did in a way. Like you have an interesting start, which is quite textural. It's that weird kind of crunch. There's obviously nibs in there. There's salt. There's a, a sort of chalkiness to the sort of um, temper. And then it sort of has a pause. And then in the finish, it's a little bit more what I expect. That kind of red berry, you know, sort of a little acid in there. It's pleasant. Clean finish. Kind of a little caramel sort of pops up right at the end. Um, yeah, but quite, not astringent at all. No. No. Um, and I, yeah, I think actually there's a good comment in there. It's better when it's chewed. I think that does sort of enable you to sort of get a little bit. It, it's a sort of interesting one because it, it, it's the, the percentages on this are actually a bit misleading because it says 63% because it's not including the nibs in the chocolate, which is completely bonkers because the nibs are the chocolate. But anyway, um, but, but I think the chewing of it actually does help because it gives you some of the astringency you're going to get from the nibs when you go through it. Now, Packaging wise, what do we think? I don't love the foil. It's it's about as environmentally as unfriendly as you can get in many ways. Um, yeah. I think what's interesting, just as a side note, is the sort of inconsistency in, in chocolate. Because the way that this is sealed implies that it must be completely sealed airtight. It must be a perfect seal, you know, oxygen's terrible. But then you've got the standout next to it, which is sort of a folded over bit of plastic. Um, and that's sort of it in terms of barrier protection. And, and there seems to be no real fixed agreement on what good storage is from a, from a sort of packaging perspective. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I think that's true. I think there is, there, there's definitely some agreement on what's bad storage. In other words, anything which will actually sort of impart the flavor. Um, sure. Which is, which is definitely a problem. Um, but I think the recognition that you need to reseal, because not many people are actually going to eat a whole bar, even of this chocolate in one go, and that's not the aim, you're meant to savour it, is, yeah, a, um, yeah I, I think th the point about basically being able to reseal it is, is a really important point to us. Um, and I think that's a bit of a challenge. I mean, you know, the other thing which I'm always on about Shaheen to do is what you sort of said about the farmer. It isn't quite that. But anyway, we've got a lot of chocolate to taste, and we are now going to basically move on to a dark milk, which I think is the most amazingly great phrase, um, grown by the wonderful Philip Calpin. If you all want to open it up and start enjoying and tasting it, um, in many ways, this is, um, I, I love this chocolate, and I think it's absolutely amazing. And it tells an amazing story. So for those of you who don't know it, the reason why it's called Femme de Virunga is the people who grow this chocolate are in the Virunga National Park. It's um, basically where the home of the mountain gorilla is. It's, you know, if you've seen Diana Fossey, all that sort of stuff, Gorillas in the Mist, that's where it is. The reason why it's got these ladies on the front is that when Philip started to um, obtain these beans, he deliberately worked with a group of lady farmers, a couple of hundred of them to start with, called the Femme de Virunga. And you sort of, if you, if you sort of like can somehow decipher um, your way through all the packaging here, there may well be somewhere in this yeah, he's got it there. He's basically, he's got a little bit of it. When you sort of um, open it up, there's a little bit of, of wording on it. But let's, let's first of all go to the flavour. And then let me tell you a bit more about the packaging, James, once you've sort of got the way you've gone to that. Um, yeah, the temp tabs are very confusing. Because they don't, you don't seem to need to tear them off to open it. No. Um, one great thing about this chocolate, actually, by the way, is that if you ever want to break it up, what you can do is you can keep it in there. If you ever want to share it up to people, you can actually keep it in the foil, which is, by the way, not foil. It's a biodegradable material, which I, over the course of 18 months when you bury it will disintegrate. Um, 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 but anyway, um, it's a 55% dark milk. So it actually will have less added sugar than this bar, which is quite interesting. Right. What do people think?
See, this is, to me, not trying to be very clever. It's just being very lovely. You know, like it's it's caramel milk. Like um, it's very sweet. It's very friendly. It's quite Moorish. Mm -hmm. This is why we eat chocolate as a comfort food. Yeah. It's the bliss point in action. Sugar, salt, fat. You can just eat this all day long. Yeah. Um, right. Now, packaging wise, what do we think? I, I did tell them that you were going to be quite blunt about this. I, I mean, design aside, functionally, I, d I found that quite a frustrating experience in that, you know, the tear tabs didn't really work properly. Nothing had stuck down. It's now kind of an, it says reseal. I have no idea how that's supposed to work. Um, maybe I'm really stupid. Am I supposed to tuck something? I don't yeah, even, even, even if you're very good at origami, I have actually got them to try and do it for me a couple of times. I don't know if we've got anybody um, actually from Original Beans on here. I did ask them to come on, but it's a bit unfair. I do love Original Beans, by the way, and we do, we do think they're amazing in terms of making their chocolate. And it's their great. packaging is great in the sense it's all completely wonderfully recyclable, but it is bloody irritating in terms of basically being able to put it all back together again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's nice that this is biodegradable. I think that's cool. Uh, but yes, I, I, I don't quite get, I feel like th this hasn't quite worked as a, as a packaging medium yeah. format, whatever we want to say. Yeah. The other thing I don't quite get about it is, is, and I don't know what the answer to this is, that it's got a huge number of languages on it, but when you open it up, it's only in English. <laughs> Which is a little bit strange, but um, anyway, it, it's all good. Um, yeah. Vitalik, I think you are right about this. I'm just looking at the chat. You are right about basically how you sort of sort that one out, but it, 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 it is a bit of a strange one. Um, but it is doing one of the things which I think you want packaging to do, which is to basically raise the importance of the environment. Because one of the great things that Philip does is every time he basically sells a bar, he plants a tree in the rainforest. And in this case, he actually gives a tree to um, one of the local, a seedling to one of the local firm of Arunga to sort of get them to, to, to grow it. Right. Um, the other thing that I would just like to point out when we talk about craft chocolate is in coffee terms, you can pretty obviously see what the difference between, you know, sort of an instant and a, um, a bean chocolate, I mean, a coffee is. In chocolate terms, actually, there are a lot of different stages which go on here, very, very few of which chocolate makers actually explain to you enough about what they're doing and how they um, are different from mass-produced chocolate. And, and, and we'll sort of go through this in a, in a moment. But, you know, just to, just to pick on a couple of them, you know, basically the fermentation, as it is in coffee, is unbelievably important. So if we look at a lot of coffee packs, they'll talk all about whether a bit, what, what is it? Is it washed, unwashed, un, whatever it is? What right. is it? Fermentations, you can have carbonic macerations and other excitements. Mm. Well, I mean, in chocolate, we, we basically, yeah, we, 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 it, it, you know, it's incredibly important how long you ferment for, what yeasts you use, and how many times you turn it, etc. But they don't really do that um, very well. And the other thing which is just extraordinary is when it comes to actually sort of talking about how they actually craft the chocolate, you know, the, the big, big, big difference in chocolate is whether or not you roast the whole bean, which is the best way to bring out the flavor, or whether you roast the nibs, which is much more efficient, but it basically destroys the flavor. I have yet to see any chocolate maker actually really talk about this. So before we go in and basically go back and again sort of taste the wonderful standout, what do we think of the packaging here? And, and full disclosure, this guy is an ex-coffee maker. I mean, you can sort of tell. Um, it feels it feels coffee-esque in breakdown and that kind of stuff. It's a little easier to put back together. Um, you know what I mean? If I, if I wanted to put this away for a while, I think that's... So it's not plastic. This is some sort of biodegradable um, sort of cellophane, uh, okay. cellulite, cellulose. It's... Um, um, right. Yeah, I think I think it is nice. To go. It's interesting that despite being a coffee person, what always struck me about chocolate is the is the sort of absence of traceability in the same way that coffee is normalized. A lot of traceability, you know what I mean? And even yeah. here, the push to the back of the product that, you know, we have on this on this one here, you've got the producer information. It's a cooperative right on and coffee would lead with that sort of front and center. Um, this this doesn't, which is kind of interesting. It's just a single origin, and as if that's the sort of bar to clear in chocolate, just be from one country, and that's enough. Yeah, um, 
it's interesting. One of the reasons why they claim they do this, and I think it's going to start changing, is they're worried about other makers getting down there and, and getting the, the, the beans before they can. Do you have this problem in coffee? Yes and no. I mean, it's an incentive to try and build a lasting relationship with a producer uh, that, that's mutually beneficial. And if it's not a mutually beneficial relationship, then, you know, good for the producer to pick someone better, pick someone who's going to pay sooner, quicker, earlier, more. So, you know, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's a problem in coffee. I don't think people worry about, you know, their coffee being sniped because, you know, typically specialty is trying to some extent to build longer term relationships with producers that are, you know, mutually beneficial. Is, is, is Wagnerian uh front and center in that is that is that the well obviously everybody's decided that it is sort of is you know it's the, it's the ride of the valkyries which everybody's going for um i mean interestingly i think actually one of the reasons why this is changing is that there are now you know a relatively small number of of very very good companies giving access to different beans and the irony of course is that this the beans from this bar actually come from original beans so it comes from what the, what, what original beans slightly confusingly call their chincho these guys call that Rumbaba. Um, it's that cooperative who they're both sourcing from. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm, but I do think the more that specialty coffee can tell craft chocolate, you know, the way to differentiate it, the way to get people to think about provenance and flavor is by focusing on the farmer or the cooperative, the estate is the key. Um, I really do. So, right. Well, it coffee, you know, prompts the idea that this bag from Colombia has a different producer's name on than that bag from Colombia, and therefore they will probably, pay for it. you know. Whereas if you just have a, a product that says Colombia, you'd expect it to be a more generic kind of product. So, so I think the danger of only putting the country or the on the front is is is, is sort of you know, Shaheen, we love you to bits, but the problem is is that it's very difficult. You know, I've actually just picked up the Peruvian one, but but M and S have got lots of other ones made by. Right. Um, and, and, you know, we just, I don't think we do enough, enough of that work. Yes. So, so this is, this is, we're not going to taste this, I promise you, but this is basically made by ICANN in Italy and it's, it's, it's nib roasted as opposed to bean roasted. But, you know, again, they've got the, what they call it, they call it single origin. This is a bit like saying wine is single origin because it comes from France. Right. Um, but that's sort of, you know, chocolate still seems to be stuck on that idea. Yeah, I think it's I think it's partly that we're a bit more secretive as an industry. We're not quite as co collaborative and cooperative as we which, which which we should be. But it's starting to change. I mean, there are some lots of other people. I think another thing is look. I mean, you know, the good, better, best in coffee is incredibly easy to understand. Um, yep. I mean, do you want to explain the difference between the three? I don't think I do. I need to exp explain the difference between the three. No, I think that's the point. Um, now, in chocolate's case. Um, let's try and get everyone just to try and sort of see which ones of these are basically what we would sort of call chicken nuggets versus roast chicken, or which ones of these are made the same way that Square Mile goes out and gets its beans and carefully roasts them. And again, everybody, please um, just sort of just just go to um, sort of Menti and just just play it around. So you, just you know, try and remember the pictures. I'm sorry I can't put all this on one picture because Menti has its slight limitations. Yeah, this is a good audience, so I think you guys sort of know what you're doing. It's not universal, though. No, it's not universal at all. See, I think if we did this with coffee, I think even the chocolate guys, you know, let alone the coffee guys, would all get it very, very easily. Yeah. But you'd look for the one with the funny words on the front that are the producer's farm name or that kind of stuff. It would be the clue is that it has this... Um, precision or detail or specificity that you know larger coffee brands don't have they tend to be like you know afternoon drinking or whatever taylor's is doing or yeah. you know more generic kind of products um I, I mean to be honest with you we're going to show you the packaging but in a slightly different way i'm just looking at the comments here um here are the answers the Cho, um, amazing chocolate makers, just based now in Oakland, um, go out to the jungle, sort of take their little conches with them there and sort of show the farmers what different fermentations made. Prestat is actually owned by a big coffee company called Illy. 
um, who own a small chocolate company called Demore, who source all their beans from, I think it's mainly the Côte d'Ivoire, um, and then basically supply that in large blocks or large sort of vats to Prestat, who remold and remelted. Bonnet, absolute superstars in the craft chocolate world, the guys who probably really are largely responsible for bringing about with Bertilux and the idea of single estate chocolate. Green and Blacks, uh, definitely chicken nuggets. Uh, Hotel chocolate, slightly more complicated. They do have a very high-end range called Rabo Estate, but basically this stuff is made by the big makers of Kubica, Calibo. Uh, and Duffy's one of the great superstars. Um, right, here's how the, you, we think you can tell the difference. Um, basically, what we just want you to do is just look at the back of any chocolate bar. So this is a bar of lint, and then this is a bar of dairy milk in the UK, the US, and France. And basically, you can sort of take any of the bars that we've given you. If you just take the standout, you can look at the ingredients really, really easily. Um, and what we would desperately love you to do is to basically also check where the farm is, but also where it's made. Because I mean, do you, in coffee's case, do you actually have to show where it's made? Where do you actually put the name of your roastery? Uh, I mean, you don't. Yeah, there's no requirement to specify made in the UK or any aspect like that. No, chocolate doesn't have it either, actually, at all. And in fact, it, it really sort of harms the poor old Belgians and the Swiss because anybody can call anything Belgian. I mean, I mean, Frederick, if he wanted to, could call this chocolate Belgium. Uh, and, really? Yes, really. Uh, yeah, um, it, it, ironically, this is actually made in Switzerland, but they don't call it Swiss. Um, it, 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 under EU la la labelling regulations, you can call anything whatever you want. It's, there's no sort of, you know, Appalachian control or anything like that for it. Um, right. Let's move on and let's talk about Raka, because we're going to use these to talk a little bit about the concepts of bridge bars. So um, um, and we'll talk a little bit about unroasting too, but um, this is made with bourbon. Um, there are basically, this is made with, with, with um, it, this is basically the beans are put in a bourbon barrel. And the story behind it is that, and I'm just going to get everyone just to sort of start changing it, uh, start trying it. Um, the, the, the story behind it is that when Nate, who's the founder, the guy you saw on the last page, was living in a small sort of bedsit somewhere in um, Brooklyn, as all cool, trendy people do, he lived in New York. Um, he he um, basically was sitting, at, I think it was a fish and chip shop or something like that, where there was lots of vinegar and it pickled absolutely everything. And he then came up with the idea of actually, could you infuse flavors into cocoa beans by putting them in barrels. And the first one he tried was with wine, which was very, very good. And then he tried it with bourbon. Um, if you're a fan of bourbon, you will immediately get what's happening here. It has a really kind of potent astringency to me. Like it's quite a, quite a violent bar uh, in that regard. It's interesting, and it, but it's, 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 it's quite an aggressive flavor profile. And that texture as well for me also. Um, which is, I suspect, part of the the whole unroasted thing. Yeah, um, it's a lot. Like it's 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 fun and it's interesting and it's it's interesting to see something as identifiable as those kind of bourbon flavors integrated into this, kind of woven through it. Especially at the sort of finish for me, like it it kind of comes with that nice kind of um, the kind of toasted note of a bourbon barrel in a way in that finish that's kind of warming and pleasant. Um, but up front, it's quite a difficult start to me. Yeah, I, I think the, I, mean, I think one of the interesting things is that the magic of flavouring cacao, of turning cacao into chocolate, if you like, is basically all the different things you can do with heat. You know, so that's what happens with fermentation. That's what happens when you dry it. It also happens, I think, when you roast. If you don't roast, you do get a very, very different flavour profile. It tends to be much earthier. So this, you know, if you tasted this without the bourbon, I think most of us would probably, on the, at least on the up front, would actually think that this is Ecuadorian because it's got those sort of earthy vegetal green notes. But afterwards, it definitely isn't. But it, and it's, I think, because at every step, the roasting, the conching, the grinding, basically the heat um, pulls out some of more of the flavors with it. Um, um, but it's interesting. Um, I, I, but I also do think that Nate does an amazing job, actually, when you open the packaging, when you open the, um, the, 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 the paper inside it, he has got an amazing story to explain the ethics behind a lot of what he does. So he'll sort of explain to you the, you know, the challenges behind fair trade chocolate in the sense of, you know, it's obviously better than most, but it doesn't really sort of help get around the price premiums, etc. Um, and he'll also sort of be very open about getting this from Simran and Coco Camille and how it all works. And, you know, it's a very, very good explanation as to what happens with... Um, why what he calls sort of transparent direct trade is so important. 
Can I just say, as a slightly odd note, it's completely fascinating to me that, uh, like, I would open this bar at the back like a normal person. Yeah. I would begin to snap pieces off it like this, but it, it sort of put the back forwards and then the pretty kind of interesting part is facing down that you may never actually see because you you know what I mean? Like, it, it just mm, feels nice, would be right. this, the fun bit forwards, the brand bit forwards, the mold, you know, forwards. Yeah, and there's some comments about the lack of snap lines, and I think that's you know interesting and fair to complain about it. But it's it's just it's a weirdly weird. It's weird to hide that part of your product that you've clearly you know worked on. Why would you put it face down where people open it? I find that weird. Yeah, I think. I mean, I, I do think that a lot of things are great on the front of this. Um, you know, they are all about being unroasted. Uh, interestingly, they don't use the word raw because they accept that the chocolate's obviously been fermented, so it's no longer going to be raw because it, can, it can't germinate anymore and also it would have gone above 42 degrees. Um, but, uh, you know, I think they do a fantastic job inside the packaging, but you've you really got to look quite hard to come across that. But it is, it is, you know, a great sort of description as to what's happening and why they're going it. Now, we call this a bridge bar. And the reason why um, we call it a bridge bar is um, sort of pretty simple, which is that I think one of the great advantages you have, James, is you know whenever you go to a coffee show, you're there brewing lots of coffee. I can't, 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 can't remember which one this one was, but you always have slightly shorter hair at that point. Yeah. Um, and then this is the old, the old sort of um, proof rock before you sort of got in and refurbed it. But again, great descriptions of all the different products there, um, where. Um, and, and, you know, one of the great things is you've got lots of coffee shops to explain what's going on. But, I mean, I think you have this advantage, which is, you know, we talked about it a lot, which is that if you want to buy a good cup of specialty coffee, you have to go to a good coffee shop. And in fact, I mean, do you want to talk a bit about your Penny Mile University? Uh, this, uh, Penny University was like a, well, that was an experiment at a different time. That was 2010. We were given a space on Red Church Street in East London by uh, Aesop who just said, be interesting for, for three months. And if you like the space, maybe rent it off as after that. Um, and so we built a weird little space that just did filter coffee because nowhere in London, apart from Monmouth, in fairness, was doing filter coffee. And Monmouth would sell hundreds and hundreds of cups of it a day and no one else would sell it. And it blew my mind. So the goal with that was to try and create a little space where we just did filter coffee, just black, no milk, no sugar, made by the cup for you. And it was really interesting. It was very popular. It went very well. It was the most brutal place to work from a sort of emotional labor point of view because it was like performing for six to eight hours a day. And it was extremely, there was nowhere to hide. Coffee, the big espresso machines are wonderful places to hide. Um, but yeah, it was just, a, it was a place to sort of say, hey, filter coffee is nice too. It's not all about espresso. Um, come and sit down, take a minute and have some fun. And I think, but you can also sort of explain what the process is when you go on to it. I think that's sort of the university aspect to it. A lot more. There is a reason why I'm showing you these numbers in a minute, which is just to sort of show you that basically any city you go to in Europe, there are going to be lots of good specialty coffee stores, right? Hold that thought for a minute. Unfortunately, this is basically how most chocolate is retailed. It sits on shelves and it's sold with bog offs. There are a few exceptions. So I'm basically sort of picking here. I think this is the uh, dandelion in, I think it's Shibuya. I'm not sure. It's one of the Japanese ones. This is also what's happening in Fuwan, which is down in Taiwan. Then we have Zota. And I think Kathy from Mirzam may have actually moved now, but this was Kathy from Mirzam in Dubai's amazing chocolate experience too. So we have got a small number of places where you can actually sort of do the equivalent of what you guys do at Proof rock, where you can actually sort of see the difference and experience it a bit. But the fundamental numbers for chocolate are pretty horrific. So if you basically sort of look at just, even if you just look at the country level, there are incredibly few places you can actually go and see craft chocolate being made. There are, you know, there are a few, there's, there's Dormouse up in Manchester. There is um, sort of, you know, you can go to Pump Street. You can go and see Duffy and that's definitely, definitely worth doing. You can obviously go and see Chocolate Tree. Um, you know, uh, but of all the capital cities in Europe, I can really only think of one craft chocolate maker you can actually go and visit. Plaque, right? Um, in, in in you know these guys in in the, these these guys who, if you're a subscriber, you would have got earlier on in the month, um, or earlier on in January. Um, the sort of the one in in in, in inverted commas, by the way, there is 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 Hotel Chocolat, who sort of as they do make some amazing, you know, Rabo Estate stuff. Um, 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 
But here's how I think craft chocolate has sort of had a go. And James, tell us if you think this works or not, which is what we sort of call the bridging bars, which is the idea of, you know, spending six quid on a bar of chocolate or four or five or six or seven. You know, it's not that much more than you spend on a good cup of coffee, especially if you're paying for somebody else. And yet, you know, most people, if they sort of saw a rum bar or, you know, Femme, they would want to sort of know what it would be more about. Um, um, so let's try, I think, um, Chuck's amazing sort of milk chocolate bar from Maya Mountain. By the way, he doesn't put Maya Mountain anywhere on the packaging at all, um, which is deeply um, irritating. Um, but he does basically put some potato chips inside it. So what do we think of this? And the aim of it, I think, is that, it, you know, basically it gives you that it's, it's sort of it's a way of sort of trying to show you that craft chocolate does some interesting and innovative things by sort of, you know, reaching out to you and grabbing you by the scuff of the neck saying, I bet you haven't tried this before. We've still got buy Dogecoin. Disgusting. I'm sorry you don't like this one. OK. All right. I'm trying to talk. Um, I think chocolate is able to have more fun. Coffee can be a bit serious. We're a bit earnest. We're a bit protective of our product in that, you know, we, we, we're, we're a bit cross if you put milk in it, let alone, you know, bits of potato, um, which I quite like in this, but I, you know, I like potato and salt and chocolate. So I think that's kind of fun. And I just like the sense of humor behind it. You know, I like that it has an, a moment of discovery, a moment of experimentation that's relatively low risk, that even if you think it's terrible, you'd love to share it with other people and be like, do you think this is terrible? This is fun. Do you, do you like, is it texture to you? Is it flavor? I don't know. I, I think it, it's a slightly more shareable experience in that regard. And that you would want, if you had this and you were like, oh, I, I've got to give some of this to someone else. Right. And so I think being fun, not being overly precious and being um, shareable, is, is are all real advantages that coffee doesn't have you know what i mean like if we get excited about coffee and we want to share it with someone else often they're missing a bit of context about why that coffee might be so unusual or so amazing or it's this variety or it's this process and it's a bit unusual um but but you know i think um this is just kind of fun and i think coffee needs to be a bit more fun and it, it seems more open to risks. And, uh, you know, I think historically inclusions, as you might have called them with chocolate, ran into a much safer zone, right? It was more like they were like, oh, you probably wouldn't like real chocolate. So we'll just stick a bunch of caramel in it or we'll stick some fruit in it or we'll stick something in it. And it's still good and you should still fi feel fine ethically about buying this thing. But we're going to sort of hide the product behind flavors that we know you'll like. Whereas, uh, you know, I remember the sort of the porcini bar from the last tasting or this one or the whiskey are, are not safe bets. They're much more risky, much more fun, a little bit playful. They'd be memorable at the very least. Yeah, I think that's definitely, I mean, that's so true. I mean, I think it's, it's sort of somehow we have to replicate what you can do in coffee, which is if you, I mean, coffee is brilliant. It's a place to meet, you know, everybody, you know, if you want, if you're, if you, if you're in a startup, you know, and you want to meet somebody or you want to have a meeting or you want to interview somebody, you've almost got to go to the local coffee shop because you won't have a room to do it in. We don't have that in chocolate, so we don't sort of have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what we've got to try and do is find different ways to sort of just invite you in and get you to try it a bit. Um, and, you know, I think that's why, you know, the Raka bar with bourbon, you know, that gets people who are into whiskey. This right. bar is sort of quite fun. Um, you know, I think it's why the Omnom bar with licorice does so well too. Um, what would be, I mean, and I think the next bar that we're actually going to try, um, you know, is, 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 is a fantastic bar from Cornwall, which sort of, I think does the same thing because basically it's playing, you know, this is Mike Longman from Chocolada, beans, clearly Oka Caribe from Dominican Republic. But what he's doing with it is he's basically playing on the fact that he's a good, you know, Cornishman. Um, again, all this is an amazingly good, you know, environmentally friendly or completely recyclable. Um, they found a way to do flow wrapping um, in recyclable packaging, as has original beans too. Um, and um, see what you think of this one. I think he's got a lot right actually on this packaging, I have to sort of say.
this one blows my mind. I just, I think, mostly because I grew up in a part of the world with a lot of gorse bushes, and I had no positive associations with them. They're not a friend. It's not a friendly bush. Um, the fact that it can be delicious, I think, it's quite a pleasant surprise. The fact that it, there's no coconut in this wrecks my head. You know what I mean? Like it's such a, it's such a, you know, intensely coconut thing. It's very sweet, but I think that's um, kind of part of it's what, what you know that kind of flavor profile um, is going for. But it's interesting. I think I think that's a really fun bar. It's a really interesting inclusion. It's a really interesting kind of like, hey, try this. Get, guess what this tastes of. You'll never guess what's in this. Again, it's it's a bar that's designed to be a little bit viral or shareable or, you know. Yeah, if you brought this out at a dinner party and you said, what's in it? I right. think, you know, the guesses would be uh, coconut, honey. I, I think, you know, you, you'd be doing very, very well if you basically could identify gorse in this. I certainly couldn't do it. No. Um, Posh Bounty. I think that's an extraordinarily good <laughs> description. That's a very, very, very good one. But yeah, but Mike sort of, you know, basically complains that his, his hands are sort of bleeding for days afterwards um, with how it works. Um, but, you know, it's a dark milk. It's over 50%. It's got, you know, it's got like three times the cocoa percentage of a bar of dairy milk, much more than an even what they call the sort of the new dark dairy milk. Um, and, you know, again, I think... You know, he, he also does some amazing other bars. He does a great, you know, he used to bring in the Ashaninka Peru from, um, Ashaninka cacao from Peru. And, um, you know, but that's quite intimidating for most of us who don't really know that much about chocolate, you know, basically, well, what was that about? Whereas this one, I think it sort of, it bridges you into it. It sort of like helps you cross the gap um, um, on this. And I am extremely sorry. There's a comment there um which is you're absolutely right this is the first time we've done a tasting without a female chocolate maker um isabel to be absolutely um blunt though this is actually made by a lady called vera hoffman she is the chief chocolate maker at original beans but you are completely right we've somehow managed to pick a bunch of chocolates which are not made by ladies which is extraordinary because of the 150 chocolate makers that we represent over 50% of the founding teams are ladies and over a third of the chocolate makers are a third of the, the, the chocolate makers are ladies too. So um, I am sorry that we've not women, not ladies, sorry, um, uh, women. Um, I'm sorry that we've not done that. We've not got any women chocolate makers. Um, I apologize. Um, that is really bad form, but it's completely accidental. It's statistically a complete abnormality. Last time when we did it, um, we did have, I think, three or four, actually, because we'd had a Yelena. We'd have had, um, did we do Fiat last time? I'm not sure who we did, but um, we, we, we definitely did um, Naive Isn't. But that's very strange because uh, 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 there are a lot of women chocolate makers. Um, so, sorry, we should have done better on that. So I apologize. Um, right. Um, but, um, yeah, so I apologize for that. That's extremely bad form. Um, right. What we'd love you all now to do is just to retaste the bars because we are almost up at our hour before we're basically moving into um, having a quick chat about um, <laughs> having a quick quiz. Um, and um, here we go. James, you're going to have to sort of, you know, give yours. Well, I don't think you actually have to do yours going out loud. Is Menti not working for people? If it's not, just let us know. I mean, I, yeah, I'll wait to say my favorite. Interesting. So it's quite interesting because we, we put the Raka on Sunday brunch and it did surprisingly well. It's interesting. It's really not held its own here. I think it's interesting, but I think it's up against sort of, if you like... Um, something fun then the other two sort of bridge bars were a bit more fun if you like something a little bit more expressive of where it's from then you know um there were other choices there so i feel like it's it's a it's a fun and interesting and you know delicious bar it's it's a very interesting set of reactions to this i would unsurprisingly be on the standout front like i i think yeah. If I think 
what I enjoy about chocolate. It's still discovery and diversity for me. And the sort of that had a really nice flavor journey for me. I, I, I like that sweet acid combination. I like kind of berry flavors. And it just had a lot to give. Like, I think it, it was great to go back and taste it after tasting something else. I think that contrast was really interesting. Um, you know, it, it suffered, I think, from being first and not having a kind of point of context. So going back to it, I think was, um, yeah, just really enjoyable for me. And, and I would also say, though, that the original beans is just yummy. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I think the standout is correct in its sizing. I think I'd be overwhelmed by that relatively quickly. My, you know, your palate would be fatigued by it. Whereas I feel like the original beans, you'd probably just keep going a little bit more than you should have done uh, uh, and eat a little bit more than you meant to. Yeah, it's definitely bliss pointing. It's definitely, you know, it's the Pringle. Once you pop, you can't stop. Yeah. Um, whereas I think the boho and the chocolate, despite being milks, actually, you they are pretty... You know, once you've had a bit of those, you really can't eat a whole bar of any of those. Yeah. Right. Um, there's a lot of questions about Tony's Chocoloni, which we do actually have a side on for later. But after we've done the quiz, I feel we should have a go at And also after we've done various other questions with you too. Um, I'm surprised that Menachow isn't higher too. But I think it, I think if you're a purist, you're definitely going to go for the standout in many ways over the Menachow. Just because, you know, it, it, it's one of the fun things about actually tasting different chocolates together. Um, Right. Um, keep your questions going. Right. We love you all now to basically, this is just whoever, basically, we're only going to be able to show about 75 of you, I think, at any one time. You do have to answer it as quickly as you possibly can. Um, and then what we're going to try and do is, you know, if everyone's in, just let us know if you're not in in the, in the, in the, in the quiz. We are basically going to get... Um, right. So if you read our Valentine's email, you'll know the answer to this. Who is the odd one out? Casanova, Montezuma, Chaucer, or Charles II? James. I've no idea. I'm, I'm, I, just, I, I was looking at it and I cannot process the answer. What, uh, okay. So the Why? answer is Chaucer, because Chaucer wrote about Valentine's Day. He's the first guy who actually sort of, in the English language, wrote about, written about Valentine's Day. But the other three... Casanova, obviously, we all sort of know about him in Venice and loving chocolate. Montezuma, you know, the first thing written about him is he had 50 cups of coffee or the froth from 50 cups of coffee before he'd go and see his wife every night. And then Charles II actually would spend, he, he basically would spend about 100 quid a year on his mistress, but at least 269 quid a year on his chocolate. So he sort of had his priorities sort of, you know, in a slightly different sort of, uh, anyway, um, uh, very sort of odd. Um, but they're all chocolate lovers. Right. So this is a this is this is similar to the one we had last time, but we've changed it a bit. Which of the following countries grow both wine and chocolate? There is no sport round. It has to be vaguely on chocolate or coffee. Now Argentina is too far south; it does not have any chocolate in it, I'm afraid. But India has um, some surprisingly good chocolate now coming out of it, and some interesting wine. Should we be? polite um so so um yeah and, and you do need rainforest so germany as far as i'm aware doesn't have any rainforest to grow chocolate um i'm sorry about the speed i will slow it down um it, it, it i think it's just a question of where you are unfortunately this is so international mentees servers are in sweden um james i really hope i've got this one right uh, DRC stands for the Democratic People's Republic of Congo. Ah, no, it's definitely Yemen. The US has obviously got Hawaii. And also, um, you know, there are, there's a tiny bit of chocolate which people are now trying to grow in Florida, although not really commercially. And Puerto Rico, and then of course, Guantanamo Bay also grows cocoa interesting but yeah. Yemen as far as I'm aware does still grow coffee but definitely has never grown chocolate doesn't have any rainforest um yeah this is something that you know who's responsible for for, for basically that the, the
Oh, it's a split. It's definitely Nestle. They were basically the people who, uh, it's, it's basically Nestle along with, um, um, you know, his mate, Daniel Peter, who worked out how to put his condensed milk and his powdered milk into the conch. And that's how we got the first milk chocolates. Fry's made the first chocolate bar, apocryphal in 1847, the cabbage is much later. Godiva, definitely not. I can't remember what all these questions actually are. We did these last week, didn't we? Oh, yes. This is, I, I, well, you've got to know your craft chocolate, but James, you've got one of these machines. Whoops, I think I've sort of given it away, haven't I? I can't see what the uh, the things are. Oh, okay. Yes, it's, it's basically what your melangeur is based on. Right, it's spice grinder. Yeah. If without those, we would not have a craft chocolate revolution, you know, because that's what you need. You can't use an ice cream maker or a magic mix or anything else like that. What you absolutely need is something to grind the cacao. And that's what made it possible is the, is the sort of the spice grinders from India being converted to make chocolate. Uh, this is actually quite fun. So we, we've done a bit of history of the history of cooking with chocolate. Um, and so which we first basically figure out how to do s'mores, chocolate digestives, chocolate mousse or chocolate chip cookies. Wow, this is obviously a very good audience. Well done, everybody got chocolate and mousse. Does anyone want to try and put into the chat who is the well-known French uh, painter who is associated with having basically made the world's first chocolate mousse? James, any ideas? No idea. Uh, Le Mousse was a very, very good idea. Believe it or not, it's Toulouse-Lautrec who is credited with basically inventing the chocolate mousse, which I always find quite good. Right, drum roll. Hopefully Menti's now had time to work out who won. Oh, Kurt, that was amazingly well done. Well done, sir. Um, brilliant. Uh, we'll come back to this in a minute. So just basically the quick recap. Uh, we would love in a minute to basically just leave a comment. Um, and then you can make this one as rude as possible because you can't actually, we can't actually sort of show it to you. But that's absolutely fine. Um, the... Um, you asked a question about Tony's Chocoloni. Uh, so let me just, does everybody know what Tony's Chocoloni is? It was set up by a, 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 a journalist in, the, in Holland after something called Harkin Engel. Um, back in the late 1990s, the BBC did a whole series of work and they discovered that lots of the people who were working on the cocoa farms in West Africa, Ghana, the Cote d'Ivoire, were actually being sold into indentured labor at the ages of sort of like, you know, five, eight, 12 or something from Mali and Liberia. And a lot of craft, a lot of special, a lot of mass produced chocolate, not craft chocolate, was being made by child slave labor. So he tried to arrest himself um, for basically eating a product or buying a product which was made with child slave labor. Um, and he sort of did very well for about a decade until he got together with the innocent drink stream innocent drinks team in um, Holland in the early 2000s. And since then, their marketing has been absolutely outstanding and absolutely extraordinary. It is slightly controversial. So what they're basically trying to do is to basically alert people to the fact that a lot of mass-produced chocolate is made with slave labor. Um, if you read their transparency report, one of the slight challenges is, is that um, it's very clear that in Ghana, it is quite possible to source cocoa um, from cooperatives and be certain where you know where the beans come from. But that's not the only place they're actually sourcing their cocoa from. They're also sourcing it from the Cote d'Ivoire. And it is generally accepted. And if you read the small print inside their, um, uh, inside their transparency report, they will actually sort of admit to this too. The bigger problem that most people have got with Tony's Chocoloni, however, is, is that actually their partner for making all their chocolate bars is Calibo. And Calibo is, I'm not really sure what the equivalent would be in coffee terms, but in chocolate terms, they're the people who sort of basically, you know, they're the people who make it possible for anybody who isn't a chocolate maker to make chocolate. But they, they make chocolate for, and, and then what, you know, what most people do with, they don't actually make their own chocolate. Most chocolate makers actually just buy it in bulk, remold it, add a bit of flavoring to it. And that's what, um, that's what Calibo, who are the biggest chocolate company in the world, do. And Calibo only know where about a third of their chocolate comes from. They, they by their own admission, so they basically don't know where the beans are coming from, so they don't know what conditions it's been produced in, whether or not it's doing lots of damage to slave labor, etc. Um, the I think the other massive problem that Tony's have got though fundamentally is is that, and I think James sort of articulated this very very well that if you want people to pay the right price for chocolate, 
then you've actually got to get them thinking about provenance and flavor. And just to put this in context, the average cocoa farmer in West Africa is paid less than ACP a day for his work. And they need two to three quid a day to live on. And so even a fair trade, you know, which is only going to give them a 20% premium, really isn't going to answer it. You've got to do what specialty coffee's done, which is to get people to think about why it's worth paying a bit more for flavor. But actually what Tony's does is it's basically just bliss point chocolate it's all about the flavorings it's actually not about trying to get you to think about the amazing flavors that you get in chocolate um i mean because that's what's brilliant about chocolate and what's brilliant about coffee is, is that they have got you know the flavor profile and and that's i think the best way to help um farmers to coming through um, if you just put the comments in the menti thing that would be absolutely great um let me just go back to this or just write to us afterwards uh um um, uh, it, look, basically, one of the things which we're going to do is I'll, I'll try and send everybody an email after this, which is what we normally do. It's going to be slightly more difficult than normal because you're slightly bigger than we normally do. If you've got questions about things like bliss points, we will answer them. We have got answers to most of that stuff actually on our blog um, as well. Um, and do come to one of our regular Welcome to the Revolution chocolates when we go through all of this stuff in a bit more depth too. But we don't have James, which is a big shame. Um, um, right. James, I'm going to basically now stop sharing the screen and I think we're going to do the Q&A. Okay. Um, and we're getting asked if we're going to do a third one of these, which I think the answer would probably be yes, James. We have to figure out what the next theme will be. Right. Um, lots of questions in the Q&A. Um, and I am just going to stop sharing now because otherwise it's going to get a bit confusing. Well, I'll leave that up actually then. Um, right. Should we go through the questions, James? Have you got them up? Do you want me to read them out? Can you see them? uh let me find out because i'm having a uh where do you want to start i can see um uh so let's start i mean so we've got does does your coffee packaging have no use no single use packaging james i think that's one for you uh it does so we're it's still some of it does some of it doesn't it's in a transitional phase at the moment um so some of it has single-use packaging where we can we it can be recycled it's complicated and we we um historically have brought packaging back from wholesale customers and then paid for it to be recycled by TerraCycle, who are one of the few companies that can do it um but yes we have had some non-recyclable stuff in there in the past which has sucked but the recyclable stuff has been complicated and most of the recyclable packaging in coffee up until about a year ago wasn't accepted by most boroughs in London or the UK as a recyclable material. I think it was type seven, if you want to get into that. So yeah, it's a, it's a challenge because what is recyclable in one place is not recyclable in another. But um, yeah, we're trying to fix it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Next one is from Kurt. Uh, Medicare is made in Madagascar as a tougher journey. Does that affect their decision? You mean in terms of the packaging, Kurt, does that drive the decision? Okay, yeah. Um, you mean why it's not i think your question i think I'm, I'm i'm guessing that your question is basically because of the way in which it's basically fully sealed that's an interesting point it may well be that that they are worried about it um i just think actually that they just could put a flow wrap machine at the end of it it used to be a long time ago when we first started working on them that they actually did hand wrap it but you may well be right because of the, the distance where they have to transport from they're slightly more worried about moisture getting into it because the two enemies to chocolate storage are moisture and heat so that's actually a very good point. Why does the sugar content vary enormously, even within the same cocoa content? Um, so that's a very good question, but I, it's really down to the manufacturer, um, the, the amount of sugar that they're adding to it. It's not a question of the bean type. Um, the bean, the, there is a, you know, basically if you, most, if you analyze a cocoa bean, it's basically gonna be 50 to 55% cocoa butter, um, one to 2% sugars, and then the rest of it will be the cocoa mass. Um, what may be happening, and I'm just trying to think this one through, is that if you add milk, for example, to the chocolate, um, that will dramatically impact the amount of sugar in it. Because basically, when you grind the milk powder, it will turn into a sort of sugar. The longer I leave milk chocolate in my mouth, the sweeter it gets. Why is that? I can feel that one. Mm, I was hoping you would. That's right. I suspect it's because um, sucrose, which would be the sugar that most of these would use, um, it's it's perception of sweetness varies with the temperature um the obvious example is is things like ice cream or soft drinks where if you if you drink a warm soft drink it's disgustingly sweet and essentially it's because your 
mouth is is better able to detect sweetness uh, the closer it gets to body temperature. So um, essentially, I, I suspect with that one, it's just it's coming up to temperature, and your body getting better and better at perceiving exactly how much sugar is there. I think that's definitely right. Um, with coffee being verifies in great oh, varieties, uh, coffee varieties and um, great varieties um, impact taste. Um, and also how they're grown. Is there any correspondence for chocolate? Yes, there is huge differentials between different bean types in chocolate. Um, we haven't done a great job yet of really mapping the cocoa genome, to be dead honest with you. But yeah, I mean, um, if you come to one of our regular chocolate tastings, we'll basically give you a bean from Peru called the porcelain or a Gran Blanco, and we'll compare it to an Amalando from the Virunga, actually the same one, the dark brother of this one, or dark sibling of this one, if you like. Um, um, so, um, yes, there's a huge amount, of, just as cocoa, I mean, coffee varietals are hugely different and fermentations differ and terroir differs. I mean, James, what do you think? I don't know enough about it. I would expect that, yes, um, what you see in coffee quite a lot is that you have um, varieties that um, express a uh, taste characteristic across terroir and there are some that, that require specific terroir to express. So I suspect something's probably similar in chocolate too, or cacao, where yes, varieties may make a difference in certain geographies. They may not with other soil types, other climates, that kind of stuff. It's 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 often a you know uh, a complicated sort of intertwining of variables. Yeah, very good question. Next one on white chocolate. Um, why is white chocolate underrepresented? Is white supposed to be less of a serious chocolate? Um, um, and then does, is the white chocolate, which isn't, which is vegan sensible. So let me ask the last one. There is definitely lots of really good vegan white chocolate. Um, Solkiki do this in particular. They're a vegan chocolate maker. Um, they do a bunch of those. Um, if you write to us afterwards, we'll send you the links to it. We do actually put white chocolate quite frequently in our tastings. Um, we did one last time. I think it was actually one of James's favorites. It was the, um, the, 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 the Singaporean um, sort of the, 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 the sort of the custard one which we did, which was really, really good. Um, um, and no, it definitely is serious chocolate. It's just there aren't very many makers who do a lot of them. Actually, Boho do an amazing white chocolate uh, with lemon, which is just absolutely fantastic. So definitely try that one. For packaging, do you think natural plastic makes from e.g. crab shells will make a difference? Uh, I don't know enough about crab shell plastics. I have seen it. Anything which is going to have flavor in it, though, chocolate is amazingly good at absorbing flavors, as is coffee. Um, okay, uh, Tom's got a question about nib roasting versus bean roasting. Um, so very simple. Um, if you're basically, if you want to increase the yield of your roasting, what you do is you steam the shells off the fermented beans and then you roast them. Um, and that increases your yield by five to 15%. It dramatically impacts the flavor. The flavor won't be anything like as good, but don't forget most mass produced chocolate, the flavor actually is not from the chocolate. It's actually from all the additives you add to it. Um, so none of our makers would dream of doing that. You have to roast the whole bean. I mean, I don't know what the equivalent is in coffee. I don't know. When you make instant coffee, is is still roasted, I'm assuming. Yeah, Nestle pioneered a technique where you could steam Robusta to um, reduce the sort of unpleasant flavors of cheaper coffees. I think that was their proprietary technique for a while. It's about as close as I could think uh, in this regard. Um, then there's a question as to why does chocolate have such a long shelf life compared with coffee? So James, I'm going to get you to partly answer that by saying, why does coffee have a short shelf life? And then I'll explain why chocolate ages. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, well, coffee staling happens in three different ways, which is um, you have uh, the loss of aromatics as things essentially float up into the atmosphere, uh, stop squeezing coffee bags. That doesn't help. Um, then you would have uh, essentially staling, where things break down uh, and then you've got oxidation of the kind of oils within coffee and um, the, the oils in coffee oxidize relatively easily at room temperature or higher than that. Um, so essentially coffee is quite temperature sensitive. The, the sort of nature and state of the oils inside it uh, make it that way. Uh, and it's quite porous as well. So those two things combined uh, are, are a problem. Um. Right, in chocolate's case, um, there are, the, it, okay, so that's, it's a little bit, chocolate aging, here's how it goes. First of all, the problem with aging anything is that you may well basically have bits of them which go off. So that's what happens with milk chocolate. Basically, the milk in it will basically, it has, it, it, it'll, it'll go off. Um, actually, chocolate, cocoa butter does not go rancid for hugely long periods of time, like 50 to 100 years. It's incredibly stable 
um, fat and butter. And it's quite possible to eat dark chocolate, provided it hasn't got anything in it, which is going to go off, which is 50 to 100 years old. The challenge is going to be that it may well have actually retempered during that period, and it may well also oxidize. But um, if you get a good dark chocolate bar, um, as long as you sort of are careful about how you store it, and as long as you're careful about how you basically bring the heat up a little bit, actually, you can taste it, you know, five to 10 years from now, and it'll taste absolutely extraordinary. It will be slightly different because it will be a little bit more mellow because you'll have lost some of the bright notes. Um, there is a challenge with the way that cocoa butter basically develops over time. It basically loses its liquid state, but that probably we can wait for another um, time. But chocolate, dark chocolate actually doesn't go off. Is that you know the only reason why it has a best before date on it and not a use by date on it is because that's government mandated. Otherwise, it could be like wine. Um, how do we ensure that the bars that you source are ethical? That is a very good question. And the answer is very simple. We don't bring on a maker until we basically inspected their factory. We obviously can't do that now by um, going to go and visit them in person, but we visited loads of the factories. What we now do is we basically do Zoom tours with them. More importantly, we won't sell a bar unless we know where the beans come from. And we know enough of the bean makers to be able to actually sort of check that they really are selling those beans if we have any doubts. And we do have some makers where we have had doubts and we've stopped selling them. We won't sell them. For us, the most important thing to basically have good flavor and to basically make certain that you know we are basically doing what we want to do which is to bring you bars which taste better are better for you and the much better for farmers on the planet is we have to know where the beans come from um kurt i have no idea i'm going to pass this one over to james we tasted one single origin and mostly a single estate and mostly mockers and frappuccinos what's the role of fun and other stuff in the success of a shop with chocolate so you know what would you suggest on that one in, wait, are we asking about the success, the role of fun in a coffee shop or the role I of fun? I think it's the role of a, yeah, I'm not sure if it's a coffee shop or if it's a, um, we we'll answer in a coffee shop and then we'll answer in a chocolate shop. Um, I, I would say the role of fun in, in coffee is broadly unexploited by specialty and deeply exploited by Starbucks, uh, who has a sense of humor about their drinks and a sort of sense of fun about them. Uh, specialty doesn't, we're a bit too serious. So I, I think there's a huge opportunity uh, and we've done stuff like trying to do the pumpkin spice latte at, at Proof Rock with, you know, spices of provenance and high quality ingredients and trying to, you know, be a bit more thoughtful, but also still having a sense of humor about this and a sweet drink with a ton of whipped cream on top. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's, yeah, an unexploited sort of um, vein or, or just opportunity to have more fun uh, because it's fun to have fun, right? Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think I have more to say. That's very good. Um, alternative milk is big in coffee shops. I think there's a whole bunch of stuff on alternative milk. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to have a quick crack at alternative milk in coffee shops? What's happening with that one then too? Um, uh, from In chocolate, it's just starting to emerge. Everybody's now trying to do an oat milk chocolate. Um, that we're just about to launch one from our friend Frederick and stand out, but you know, everybody's got them. Um, you know, Maru does one, um, you know, well, actually it's not, an, it's not, it's an alternative milk in the sense it's coconut milk. We have a lot of coconut milk ones inside there too. Um, what do you think about what's happening with um, alternative milk? I think it's, um, I, I obviously I'm, I'm not going to talk about it, but I have a vested interest in it. Um, I think that there are lots of people who understand that dairy can be problematic and would like to avoid it and, but haven't wanted to compromise. And I think products have gotten much better. I think Oatly have changed the game. Uh, in terms of making it normal to choose a non-dairy product over a dairy one. Um, it's interesting. I mean, milk has a bunch of interesting uh, sort of chemical and sort of food science-y properties that make it quite unique that are hard to replicate with other things, um, especially around things like sort of bitter blocking and that kind of stuff where, you know, it plays such a crucial role in, say, you know, milk chocolate is that sort of buffering of bitterness. And, and milk is good at that in a way that, non-dairy milks are not um but yeah it's, it's definitely it's definitely changing and i think that it's less and less of a compromise to 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 drop dairy and have something else yeah i think that's good uh the question james about whether or not square mile sells ground coffee for an aeropress sadly we do not um sell ground coffee at the moment and we probably won't in the future either just because we feel like it's not worth as much as whole bean coffee and yet we charge the same price for both. And I feel like we'd rather just sell the thing that we, we know will be good and fresh. And, and that's kind of why we're a bit difficult. Um, but you could go to Proofrock and Evelina will grind it for you. Yes, we will. 
Um, and that's just because you can take it home and enjoy it straight away. But yeah, a, a hand grind, a grinder of any sort is one of the best investments you'll ever make into coffee. It will change your mornings for the better permanently and, and um, they're getting better and cheaper all the time. So, yeah. I definitely agree with that one too. Um, there's a great question here from David Sass from Page One SEO, which is what's a reasonable benchmark for minimum price for quality chocolate that cares for its producers? So I don't really have a complete answer to that one, but what I will tell you is, is that the least expensive makers who we have, who are absolutely fantastic, are Zotta, who are basically three fifty four pounds a bar, but it's a big bar, or um, Willie's. Um, who are down at three pounds a bar. It is very, very difficult below that to actually sort of, you know, pay the farmers enough and to basically have good enough quality chocolate. Because don't forget, in good quality chocolate, there's a lot of chocolate in it, unlike sort of dairy mills, where there's like 80% sugar. Um, but I would say that if you're going to, that is the reason why supermarket chocolate is so hard, because they don't sell bars which are less than two quid. And it's very, very difficult to do great chocolate for less than three quid or really four quid. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, um, all of our chocolates, well, 95% of our chocolates are going to be below eight or nine pounds and 80% are going to be below seven pounds. I need to update those figures, but that's where it is. So, you know, for the price of two or three great coffees, you can get a great bar of chocolate, which you can share with some people there too. Um, the climate change one, we'll write to you a little bit more about then. Uh, hot chocolate with or without whipped cream. Uh, I don't know, James, what's your view on that one? Uh, I mean, it depends what, I don't know. I, I, I think to if you if you love it, do it. You know what I mean? As long as you've got everything in there is of, of good provenance and, and soundly sourced, go for it. You know, like uh, I don't think there should be limits on how to enjoy things. Yep, I think that's definitely right. I would agree with that one. I personally am not a huge fan of cream, but I do love, um, if I make my drinking chocolate, I almost always make it with milk. I don't do it with water. Um, Initiatives to bring benefits, profits, chocolate makers back to the producers. Um, so I think they basically try and do it by um, paying a fair and sustainable and long-term price to the cocoa growers. Um, I don't think there's anybody who in the craft chocolate world has, you know, is making a mint, put it that way. I think what they're all trying to do is basically alert people to the attention that if you have great craft chocolate, it's going to be better for the farmers, it's going to be better for the planet, it's going to be better for you. Um, it, it's not, say, like, I'm not casting any aspersions here, but it's not, say, like craft beer or it's not like fine wine. You know, it, it's, it's, people go into this because they're passionate about the flavor and because they really want to help the, 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 the farmers. And the best way to do that is to basically buy beans where you know that the farmers are getting paid more than a living wage for what they're doing. James, we've got a question is to do a coffee and chocolate pairing session. I think that'll probably have to be post lockdown, I think. Probably would be. I think it's difficult to do remotely. It's possible, could be done, would be difficult. Uh, we have to do it in the morning. That would be a requirement. Or we could do a lot of decaf, I guess, but yeah. probably would want, you know. Probably tend to be sort of jumping off the walls when you do the coffee one, I think. Um, but yeah, um, blends of cocoa beans like we see in coffee. Uh, I'd love to hear your views on blends of coffee beans, James, and then I'll tell you what I think is happening with chocolate there too. I think this is a long-standing tradition of blending coffee, and, and I think you can create products that are sort of more than the sum of their parts. Uh, and I think you can achieve, you know, in, in an industry that has a lot of very small lots of coffee that disappear quite quickly, there are times when you want some some consistency of products you know some something to be around longer than six weeks so i think in both of those cases you can make some interesting things i think it's an, another place where i feel that coffee stopped having fun and needs to have a bit more fun again um but yeah i'm pro i'm pro blend as long as it, it's it, it's a it's not about hiding the components but showcasing the components still historically blends were a nice way to sort of hide a bunch of different stuff under a magic secret recipe and not have transparency and i think if you go the other way and you're like no this is what's in it and this is why that's an interesting sort of approach yeah i think that's absolutely right so there's a whole bunch of questions around packaging for chocolate and how you should store it i'm going to try and answer all of those in one go then i think we should basically start sort of trying to bring it to a, a, a wrap up so so when you subscribe to coco runners which is a plug for us to doing it again um we send you in your first box something which looks like this which is a pouch and the reason why it's a pouch is a dark pouch and you can basically just store all your chocolate in it which you don't eat um do not put it in the fridge because if you put it in the fridge you're going to retemper the chocolate and that will basically change its crystal structure and you will not get the same flavor out of it at all but the um you know anything to do with packaging write to us we'll tell you about how to do it sorry storage we'll write to you we've got blog posts on it 
But the fundamental thing is this device, Lizzie invented it, um, very clever. You can sort of even write your names of the different chocolate bars on it. Um, and it is just um, a great way. I mean, Pump Street, you know, got some amazing packaging. Um, you know, not surprising given who Joanna's um, husband is, but, but um, you know, brilliant packaging. We basically asked them, they said it was okay. We now sell these uh, and you get these when you subscribe to us because, you know, with the, I love Philip. I think these are amazing, but basically that it just, it's all over the place. You know, it falls all over the place. If you put it in one of these, it's great. It just sort of keeps that um, story. Um, uh, Nancy has got a question about Menacao, and I'm glad you asked it. Why does the color of the person on the Menacao packaging reflect the percentage of the cacao? Um, I'm not sure why Shaheen has done that, um, because you're right, the, the sort of the 100% gets darker. We get we, a lot of questions about this because a lot of people think that Menacao packaging, which has got basically different indigenous peoples from Menacao, the Malagasy, on the front of their packaging. And they think it's, um, you know, sort of culturally inappropriate and insensitive. They get incredibly upset about this because they actually see it as a way of promoting and explaining what's going on amongst their people. And they would be very upset if you thought that's what they were doing. But if that is how it is perceived, we obviously need to do it. Um, in coffee, there's, there's beans that are eaten by a type of weasel. I think that's the, uh, is that the civic cat thing? Is yeah. there an equivalent for chocolate? That, um, no, not that I'm aware of. I don't think anybody's ever tried to sort of take digested coffee beans out of lemurs or anything like that. James, there's a question as to where you're getting your jumpers from. Um, uh, question the question is, our filter blend, which of the today's chocolates should we pair it with? Uh... Probably actually the original beans. Hmm. Like Which filter supposed to be a very friendly product that's just, you know, Moorish. I feel like that's that. Uh, good question about where can you buy um, good chocolate from a major retailer. Well, if you count Proof Rock as being a major retailer, they obviously sell great chocolate. Specialty coffee stores aren't a bad bet to sell good chocolate. Just make certain, again, that it passes the tests of... You know, do you know where the beans are coming from? Do you know where it's being made and are the ingredients good? Um, what about um, Waitrose and those kind of online Willies, retail? Willie's is the only one which is in Waitrose and occasionally in Sainsbury's. Otherwise, you just can't do it. it it's a real pain. I mean, it's it, even Whole Foods, you know, in America does a good job. Over here, we are in Whole Foods, but it's only seven stores. Um, uh, best band for chocolate baking, uh, Cocoa Runners, which we use with Menacal. It's just fantastic. Have you heard or worked with the proper chocolate company from Dublin? No, I don't think we, we definitely haven't worked with them and I haven't heard of them either, to be absolutely honest with you. Uh, I think we're almost through. James, um, I think I'm going to basically sort of say, look, if you've got any more questions, just send them in to us. Um, we are now well over the hour and a half that we've basically had. Um, James, what would you like to do? There's the next one is the question, I think. I have no idea. I think uh, something a little bit more... Uh, uh, we could do something a bit geeky and do something around fermentation, maybe. Yeah. Or, How about roosts and fermentations? Yeah. Something like that. Something, something a little bit more uh, in-depth, like getting a little weirder, uh, maybe. I'd like to learn about that stuff a little bit more and taste more about that, so that's possibly a little bit selfish on my part. But yeah, I'd like to understand some of those sort of like pre-roast stages as well as roasting as well. Um, yeah. Okay. We will try and arrange it. Um, we will definitely try and arrange that one then too. And um, people also ask, where can you get a good mocha? Where can you get a good one? I think Square Mile. Again, original beans, pure porcelana. Proof rock, proof rock. Proof rock, proof rock. Yeah, no, they, they, and, uh, but I, I have to bring in my personal pl plea here, which is when can we have the spiced pumpkin? Latin Next brought back, please. Autumn. Next autumn. You've got to wait. It's a seasonal drink. But we need an Easter seasonal drink pretty fast. We probably do, actually, yeah. Uh, I'll have a think. I'll have a think. Um, there's a very stupid recipe video on YouTube tomorrow. So maybe that, but it's not very Easter. It's just very stupid. Um, it's not stupid. It's just ridiculous. Anyway, um, yes, I'll have a think. James, again, I cannot thank you enough. I cannot thank all of your fans enough for sort of joining on this. Absolutely brilliant. Um, 
you know, um, hope to see you soon, the other side. Um, and just thank everybody very, very much for attending. James, cannot thank you enough. Uh, we'll send everybody around an email tomorrow. Any more questions, do write to us. We will definitely do our best to try and sort of answer them all. Right. It was um, a lot. Of thank you very much for having me. Um, really enjoyed it. Excellent. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank you.